Hi, I'm the Tokenator, and this is Game Theory Impossible. Today we're going to be doing things a little bit differently than normal. Instead of looking over a previous two cent, five cent session, we're going to be drawing from a live one dollar, two dollar game that I played recently at the casino. In fact, I played it earlier today. Here's a picture of me sitting at the table to give you an idea of how it went. The hand that we're going to be looking at gets off the rails. The villain in the hand was tilted at this point, and I certainly get out of line. I specifically think that this hand is a perfect hand to use to go over a concept that I think is fundamental to understanding and playing good poker, and that is the concept of pot odds. This will be the first episode in a series that I hope to accumulate over time, which will go over tips and specifically strategies that I use basically as I learn them in my poker journey. Pot odds is a important concept that needs to be understood by any poker player that wants to make any kind of headway in the game. And though I've known it for a while, I don't think I've mastered the concept until recently. I think that even still I can use more reinforcing, so making a video like this helps me, and I do hope that in the process somebody watching it does get something out of it. Even if you do know what pot odds are, you can stick around and see a pretty interesting hand develop, and see how pot odds plays a part in my decision making as we go through. So let's jump right in. Crazy hand used to explain pot odds. This comes from a $1, $2 game at the Hialeah Casino. This casino in Miami is one of my favorite to play at. It lets you buy in for 150 big blinds and the games get wild. There's a lot of action, people ship stacks around often. Of course, like any $1, $2 table, there will be a plenty of people buying in pretty short, but still, even then, they'll give you quite a bit of action and it ends up being a really great game. So let's start off by asking the question, why is this hand ridiculous? As you'll see in the thumbnail, you're probably wondering, what is crazy about this hand? Well, to start, let's look at what my cutoff range generally is at these live games. So this is the range that I roughly use, especially it's my default range that I'll use in the cutoff with no reads on my opponents. At this point, it's not at the biggest player pool and I've gotten a read on most of my opponents. I would say on average when I sit down at a table, I know at least half of the table at this point and have a pretty solid read on at least half of the table. So here we're opening some offsuit aces, any suited ace, pretty wide range, 26% of hands, and look, suited connectors all the way down to 5-4 suited. So pretty liberal here, and I'll open it up even wider if I think that the button player doesn't stay in with enough hands, and in particular, if I think the small blind and or big blind either don't call enough so I can steal their blinds, or play too straightforwardly after the flop, making it very easy to navigate when in position against them. So, what makes this hand ridiculous? So we get out of line right to begin with. I open 3-2 suited from the cutoff. Even for me, this is pretty wide. But the button player was not calling or getting in there often enough with his position, and he's a player I had reads on. And the small blind was kind of a relatively unknown. I've only played with him in this session. And the big blind I knew did not defend widely enough. So we thought we were going to steal this a fair amount of the time. And even when we don't, I'm pretty sure uh, the players that we'll be playing against play straightforwardly enough that maybe it's not profitable, but it certainly is close to break even. So here we are. And the only player that calls us when we open to $10 is the small blind. So the small blind is sitting with a short stack of $75 and... Again, I don't have any reads proceeding today, but he was steamed up at the moment. I remember he had been losing a bunch of hands consecutively, and he was recently sitting to the right of me, and I won a few hands off of him, and he changed seats either to get away from me or to get out of his cold seat. Uh, recreational players can be, they can be pretty superstitious about seat selection and things like that. So anyways, when you see somebody doing those kinds of things, they're not thinking about the game very rationally and they're a great target for some of these kinds of plays. So anyways, he calls and it's a pretty dream scenario. Even though we have a terrible hand, we're going heads up to a flop against a pretty easy to play against opponent. All right, with $22 in the pot, the flop comes king of spades, queen of hearts, and five of spades. When it checks to me, I decide to throw out a continuation bet here assuming that he's probably going to be donking a fair amount if he has a strong hand, and even if he doesn't, 
He will be able to call, certainly, with any one pair hand, but we have a flush draw, and we will probably be able to fold any one pair hand out, if not by the turn, by the river. So we bet $10, which so far not so crazy. Obviously three highs, not very good here. And now small blind raises to $25. So this is where we introduce the idea of pot odds. Pot odds are essentially described as the relationship between the amount of money that you need to risk, in this case what I need to call, and what you stand to win. So we need to call $15 to win a pot that will be $72 after I call. It's an important thing to add your bet to the total to understand what the true value is. That's where you get the true calculation. So the actual equation for this is pot odds equal risk divided by risk plus reward. You can see here that risk plus reward can be simply thought of as the total pot, including your call. So let's calculate it. If we plug in the numbers here, I need to call $15 because he raised to $25 after I had originally bet $10. So I need to call 15 additional dollars to win a pot that will be $72. So we just divide 15 by 72 and that gives us a percentage. We see here that the percentage is 21% and then we just have to decide how much equity in the hand we have and that will determine if a call is reasonable. So I've used Poker Cruncher here to run the numbers. The top picture here with my three deuce of spades is against a range of his that includes only top pairs and two pairs and a set of fives. So no draws, essentially, just value hands. And the reason that I've done this is because I think that often these players are not check raising as a bluff. And so what my main concern is, is seeing what my equity is versus their value hands. In this case, I think their value is basically top pairs and better. So against Villain's best range, uh, which is top pair, two pair, and a set of fives. I don't think he ever has queens or kings here, really. We have, by the river, 36% equity. We have about 15% equity more than we need, which is significant, making it a pretty easy call. However, if we think he's ever going to just jam turn, we have to consider what our realistic single card equity is, meaning how much equity we have to get to the turn. So if we only deal to the turn in Poker Cruncher, it pulls out this number, which is 19.32% equity, which means that we're only going to improve uh, against that range that much. So even in this case, where we only make it to the turn, we're only like a 1% dog. We're only off by a little bit compared to what we need to call. So for that reason, we call. Uh, and another thing to consider is even if we're off, by that 1%, right, a little bit less than we need to call, we're in position, so in the event that we do improve, we're very likely to get paid because if he doesn't bet, we can bet. So even though we're not getting direct odds, we can actually stand to win more money very easily. So it's an easy call, even though we only have three high. So we call $25 total, and we go to a turn. The turn is a pretty nice turn. It's the six of clubs improving us to not only the flush draw, but a now a gut shot straight draw. And now small blind bets $20, making the pot $92 total. And again, we can plug in that same equation, pot odds equal risk divided by risk plus reward. Pot odds equal, in this case, I need to call $20 to win a pot that will be $110, including my bet. That gives us 18.18 repeating percent equity. And if you needed to estimate it in real time, it wouldn't be hard to do. Uh, we know that it's going to be a little bit less than 20% pretty easily because the pot's around $100 and we need to call 20. So not hard to estimate. And we can see that with Poker Cruncher, our equity actually at this point is great. We have, even though he's picked up more two pairs with uh, King 6 in this situation, we have now 26.34% equity against that value range. Now, the question is, how do we estimate our odds in real time? Because we don't have Poker Cruncher on the day. A simple way to do it is, first of all, you have to assume which of your outs are good. In this case, 
because we don't believe that Villain is going to be check raising and then continuing to barrel, especially with a short stack, with very little uh, that isn't value, we can assume that basically any four, which would give us a straight, and any spade is going to be good. And that means that nine spades left in the deck plus four fours gives us 13 cards that can improve us. The way that we estimate our equity is we divide 13 cards by the amount of unseen or unknown cards. And the way that we calculate that is we take the 52 cards that are in a deck and we subtract the known cards. In this case, the board, which is four cards that we can see, and my hand, which is my two hold cards. So that leaves us with 46. So we divide 13 by 46, and that gives us a percentage. In this case, our percent equity in the hand that we can estimate is about 28.26% which is certainly enough. We only need to have 18% equity based off of the pot odds that we were offered. So this is great. Now, a way to simplify this is instead of dividing by 46 or whatever the number of unseen cards is, you can instead multiply the amount of outs you have by two. Simpler to do, multiply 13 by two, and we see that we get 26, which is pretty darn close to 28% and is certainly close enough in live poker to make your estimations. So given that information, even as we estimate, we certainly have enough odds to continue. So we call. Hero calls $20 and we move on to a river. The river is the eight of diamonds and we totally break out. We have three high now and small blind with $22 left in his stack decides to check. Now, Sitting here in my shoes, I think three high is never good here, but also small blind is never going to fold, right? Remember that we assume that small blind is probably check raising, very value oriented, in which case, even if he only has one pair here, maybe he was getting out of line and check raising a really bad pair, or he just hit a pair on the river, whatever the case, if he has any value, even ace high might find a call here if we bet, because think about the pot odds that we're offering him. If we bet $22, the pot becomes 134, and he needs to call $22 to win a pot that would be 156. So he would only need like 14% equity or something like that. So I don't think he's ever folding because ace high might even be good that often. So we just check back. And this is where the most crazy part of the hand happens that I don't think I've seen ever. <laughs> uh, it, it's happened similarly to me, but not like this. Villain in the small blind mucks when I check back. Now I made sure not to give off any tells about the strength of my hand. I just checked back and Villain mucked. And I remember looking at the dealer very surprised and I said, did he muck? And villain killed his hand, and I mucked immediately after. I considered for a moment showing him three high to see if he went off the rails, but the thing is that if somebody's really, really heated in these kind of low stakes games, uh, they might be prone to really getting out of hand and taking the game off the rails, getting kicked out, and we don't want to cause a scene. So even though that might've been interesting and a little bit fun, uh, I chose to be the hero in this spot and not uh, antagonize too much. In any case, we take it down at showdown without needing to show down with three high. Literally the worst hand we can possibly hold, the nut worst, and uh, pretty amazing outcome. We call with good pot odds the entire time and we are rewarded magically at the end. Moral of the story, is don't muck ever. Whenever I'm pretty sure I'm beat and I don't have a pair, I will often just verbalize ace high because that's a totally reasonable thing to have in a lot of situations, especially when a flush draw bricks or whatever. And often when I say that, villains will table their hand proudly if they have a pair or even if they have their own ace high, they'll say I have ace high also. And then you know if it's time to muck. So. Don't muck, do not muck. It is just not a good idea. In this case, villain 
maybe I had the wrong read. Villain pr might have been actually raising with some kind of draw, but he failed to consider the fact that I might have also been on a draw and mucked his hand, not realizing that me giving up on the river could mean that I actually have a worse hand than him. In any case, that's the end of the crazy hand. It's mainly just a crazy conclusion with a little bit of out of line play in the beginning, but just kind of hilarious. I could not believe it when I saw it. I whispered over to the guy sitting next to me, uh, the button player that folds way too often, and I told him I had three high, and he and I both had a good laugh about it, and villain in the small blind was none the wiser, leaving, going home a little bit steamed, but not so steamed that it would be unforgivable. Anyways, that's it for this episode. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you on the next one.